let's take a step back for a second. Um, when I was preparing this talk, uh, as usual, I was procrastinating, right? I have to do slides, I have something to say, but it's boring to, to get the slides properly, right? So I always try to find a way to digress, and what's the best way to digress to read your tech news sources? And that day I found a very interesting uh, discussion about microkernels and why they're not more successful even if they're in theory superior. So that was a very interesting thread with a lot of people with uh, a lot of knowledge that I don't have about kernel architecture, so I thought I found a very good way to procrastinate working on these slides. But at some point reading this thread, I read a comment from a, a kernel developer which struck quite close to home, honestly. Let's take a look at the core of this comment. So this guy is a, a developer for kernels, he worked on microkernels, he worked on Linux, and at some point in his description, he says, uh, if you ask me to define the problem of microkernels with one word, that would be complexity. The bugging is hard, managing resources is hard, obtaining reasonable performance is impossible, and finally he says, don't, just don't be a fool like me, avoid becoming obsessed with trying to achieve the impossible. So at this point, you're probably asking yourself, isn't he supposed to talk about microservices, not kernel architectures? Yes, yes, I'm going to talk about microservices. I'm going to talk about what microservices mean for your infrastructure, which challenges we had at Wikimedia introducing microservices, what are the mitigations we put in place. And finally, I'll try to give you a framework to answer the big question. Are microservices work for you? I'm not going to give you an answer, I will. So, Back to why I started the talk with talking about microkernels. <sighs> well, I could say, well, basically, but the analogy that I have is that microservices are the microkernels of distributed architectures. And why is that? That's because micro microservices introduce complexity to your environment. Your environment. Let's just think about it. You have just one single monolithic application that does everything. You just deploy it everywhere. It works. Now, suddenly, you have 20, 100 different services that to talk to each other, to talk to the client, to build the, the, the response to your client. That's incredibly more complex in a lot of ways that are not obvious immediately when you, when you start thinking about the transition, probably. And basically, my, the whole point of this talk is that going the microservices way has a big cost, and that cost is in terms of how you have to build your infrastructure, because if you don't do that, if you don't invest upfront in your infrastructure when you go to micro, the microservices way, you will just have problems with observability of your infrastructure, you will have problems that the debugging will be harder, you will have to change the tooling you use, and performance is going to be worse unless you offset it in some way. So exactly like microkernel development, right? Think of that comment, if you just change microkernels with microservices in the parts that I um, I like it, and that would probably be uh, basically uh, the same thing. The problem is that this kind of in in investment is very expensive, and when you would see a lot of people on the internet right now telling you, if you don't do microservices, you're doing it wrong. Well, first of all, uh, I think it's a good uh, measure in general not to trust blindly see what people say on Reddit or on other news. But I would even argue that what people should say, or at least the people that have used microservices in production, that have run microservices in production, is that microservices might be worth the costs. Uh, so let's see for a second what the costs are and what was were for us specifically. Okay, first some background about who we are. I think most of you know the, the websites that we run. Uh, Wikimedia Foundation is the organization that supports projects like Wikipedia. It's not just Wikipedia, there's also Wikimedia Commons that you probably know, Wikinews, Wikisource, not Wikileaks. <laughs> As you can see here, we have a pretty healthy amount of traffic. Uh, we are one of the top 10 websites in the world, um, and we have 45 million edits uh, per month, uh, a lot of new registered users every month. Our infrastructure though is pretty lean, so first of all we don't use cloud. So this is the difference with 
what a lot of you are probably doing right now and keep that in mind for what I'm going to say about our problems. Probably your problems might be a bit, a bit upset if you use cloud. You can't use cloud for costs and privacy reasons. So we built our infrastructure. Uh, we had two main data centers, both located in the US, uh, that had all the application layer, and then we had three uh, smaller data centers, just caching pops, uh, distributed around the globe, which are basically there to beat the speed of light. So when you try to see a page on Wikipedia, uh, the response to you will probably be cached uh, if you see a page that's not really, really weird, and the response will come from Amsterdam instead of coming from Washburn in Virginia. So, uh, the round trip time is going to be reduced a lot and you have a better experience. It's basically a homegrown CDN. Again, we can't use a commercial CDN for a serious reasons, first of all, privacy. Even if we have that amount of traffic and we need to, to build our infrastructure, our infrastructure is pretty lean. We have 1,400 servers, which for such large websites is basically a joke. Uh, and our engineering team is even smaller compared to that, to assess what we're doing. We have about 170 engineer, don't quote me on that number, please, because it's very hard to determine, <laughs> honestly. And the SAV team is right now is 25 people, of which six are dedicated to the application layer, so the things that we're going to talk today uh, about today. I have to note that one year ago the team was significantly smaller, so we're finally expanding, uh, thanks to all of you that donated in the last few years. Um, so, what we've been doing with microservices, we've been adding microservices uh, since 2000. At the Foundation 2014, we were basically a monolithic application. We had MediaWiki that was doing everything. Then we had a, a small external service called Parsoid that was just doing uh, some parsing of Wikitext for uh, our, what you see is what you get editor. Fast forward to 2018, you see here Tag Cloud that I created for KubeCon basically last year. And I didn't put everything that we had here, uh, just a few of the services. If I had to redo that back out today, just putting the most important service, it would be double the size. So it said not to do that, it just expressed the idea that we are rolling out like services all the time. We have some experience with the growing pains of introducing microservices, especially in an infrastructure like ours, which is 15 years old and a lot, with a lot of baggage, uh, of baggage. Especially because we didn't, although uh, we knew that there would be costs, we just went with it. And so, what were the challenges that we encountered? So first of all, re uh, the first challenge I, I see is retooling. You have to uh, take your, the tools that you had, probably the tools that you had before you moved to microservices, you used to, to manage your infrastructure are going to break down pretty fast. Then there is a problem with interface proliferation. You have much more services to care about, so the interface, the hidden interface of all these services will be different. There's going to be an increased amount of communication between people doing infrastructure and people doing products. And finally, the, the last challenge is that distributed architectures are hard. Let's get into a bit more detail on these challenges. So, retooling. First of all, configuration management tools like Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Salt, whatever. They're all very nice, they all have their great things and their shortcomings. Uh, I don't think they will only get you that far if you're building a lot of microservices, right? It's, they're not thought for that, they're thought for configuring the machine statically and then evolving the machine over time. Uh, that model really don't, don't work out in the long run when you're trying to do microservices, you need a much more dynamic infrastructure. But this gets me to the last point here, which is static resource allocation. When you have one monolith, right? You can just say, okay, I have this amount of computing power, I throw it all to that application, and then I throw all the traffic to, to that cluster that's gonna be utilized to the best, to the best possible level. Uh, you don't have resource contention between different services, you don't have those kind of problems, you don't have surges in one specific service, all the surges of traffic will go to the, to the right application, which is the monolith. The moment you st you're starting to build uh, microservices and you try to do that on a traditional platform, uh, use Puppet and so on to, to, man to manage it like we do, or whatever, any of, of those reconfiguration in system, and you deploy your configuration, uh, your, your uh, resources declaratively through these configuration management systems, you're gonna be hitting a uh, uh, hard stop very soon. Actually, uh, 
it was such an incident that really made me realize we had to um, to, sh to, to shift gear and to do the do serious retooling. What happened is that at the end of the Obama administration in the US, some volunteer uh, uploaded all the um, the press conference for the White House during the Obama years, so eight years of press conferences every day, to our uh, Wikimedia Commons project. That's a great thing, right? It's great. Somebody, some volunteer just uploaded a lot of free knowledge to our systems. It's exactly what we're, we're there for. Uh, I think there's, uh, there is one of my colleagues in this room who was involved in trying to manage that thing because that basically overwhelmed completely our video scaling uh, services. And before we could adapt our infrastructure to, work, to withstand that kind of surge in, uh, in, in unusual surge in the amount of videos that were uploaded, it took like a week, uh, a senior developer and two SREs to, uh, to fix the thing. And I said, okay, that's absolutely not possible. But that's not the way we should work. That's a horrible service to, uh, to our community. But this is just part of the problem. The other huge challenge you're going to face is that as soon as you build microservices, your dev environment is going to become more complex. When you have just one monolith, right? People just have one simple dev environment, like we have a vibrant image that people use to, to develop many wiki. Then you start saying, okay, but if you want to test something that works, like the API that's using the what you see is what you get editor, you also have to install this other service, and then this other service, and then you need Cassandra to back that, that other service. And the whole thing becomes incredibly more complex. It is a testament to our developers that they managed to uh, work with the background image in building incredible things inside that background image so that they can kind of work with these things. It shows how brilliant they are, but it's really clearly not the tool for that, right? And it's really, really hard to make it uh, seamless in a, in a microservices infrastructure for the developers to, to build that environment correctly, unless you do uh, separate the microservices very, very well. The same can be said for your CI and CD uh, systems, right? When you have just one application, you can basically tailor, you, you just duct tape things around uh, existing open source solutions tailored just for that application. Then you have other applications that you want. Since you're doing microservices, you want your teams to be free to make some choices, right? In terms of what language they use, um, how the API will be structured, how the deployment is going to happen, and how. And of course, like if you're used to deploy a PHP application and you deploy uh, a Java Node.js application, that's going to be different. The way you deploy it, it's going to be different. If it's a Go application, it's a different way as well. If it's written in C, it's going to be another way as well. Uh, again, so your CD is going to be needed. It's going to need to be become incredibly more complex and be able to uh, scale with a number of microservices. Same for the deployment stage. And finally, the last challenge we had is that. Even if you do collect the logs from all your beautiful microservices, just collecting all the logs from everything is not enough. You also need strong correlations between the logs of different services. Okay, enough for uh, retooling. So you have to change your tools. Also, there is another problem that presents that gets presented to you, which is um, interfaces. Your, your, any application, any, any service, be it a monolithic application or a microservice, has a series of interfaces besides their public API to be, our, uh, to be to a public, right? Uh, they have a monitoring interface, so how do you monitor that? Uh, how, do you, uh, how does the service log? How do you create alerts on top of that? How do you configure your service? It's, is it a 12 factor app, so you just use environment variables, or it is using uh, a, a remote configuration service, or is it using YAML files or JSON files? How do you manage these things with your configuration management, or uh, how do you manage this, this, all this proliferation interface? And finally, more importantly, RPC interface. How does this service talk with the rest of your infrastructure? If you don't, if you have just a monolith, this is, not, this is a no problem, right? You just have one interface for each of these things that's all the same, so you can just adapt to that. But if you start building microservices and you don't have uh, some way to, um, to live with the problem, all of these interfaces are going to be potentially different from service to service. And so you would have to adapt to that other complexity. Then another big problem is that uh, 
in, independently of how your um, company is organized, if you do like hardcore DevOps, you're gonna have an SRE team. Well, good luck with that. Uh, or if you have people, you will have people working on the infrastructure in some way, right? And you will have those people need to talk with developers a lot. I mean, it's the whole point. But if you do microservices, the bandwidth needed for communication is going to be, be increased by a lot. Uh, how many how many questions, how many things a developer need to, to know about how infrastructure works um, when they have to produ productionize a server, a service, so something that needs to go into your production environment and work with the rest of production. Compared to what we need to just add a library and an API module to, uh, to a single application is exponentially higher. And I mean, it's a good thing in some way, but it means that your infrastructure people can get overwhelmed by the amount of time we have to spend with people building a new service. Because, let's be honest, I don't expect somebody building uh, uh, Node.js content for something to know the intricacies of how things work on, on, on uh, the infrastructure level. So, they will need to come to you and talk with you. And there are a lot of choices and needs that will need to be addressed for each service. Finally, this is the biggest problem, and I'll be honest. I'm not going to propose you a solution for this challenge, because if you, if you have a solution, please tell me, because I'm very interested. And my point is, distributed architectures are hard intrinsically. It's very hard to make them um, reliable. And also, the, the, I think the biggest problem is it's very hard to have a comprehensive view of a good architecture. So let's look at this uh, weird uh, building, right? That's how you need the risk to end up. You can have incredibly smart people working on every, like, you will have, in a Microsoft service architecture, you will have somebody working on the columns, right? And they can create beautiful columns that are perfectly chiseled and, per and super nice and uh, incredibly well, well done, but, if that, that the size of that column doesn't fit between the, the, the roof and the balcony, that's going to be a problem. And you will have a new, going for people caring about infrastructure, will have to put something between the column and, and the floor to make it fit. And so on. You could have people building all the things in, uh, more or less in isolation. It's going to be then harder and harder to keep a complete view of what, what's happening. And you can end up with a building like this. If you look at each single part of this Baroque building, it's very well done. But the whole thing is kind of weird, right? Okay, enough with the challenges. Let's talk about what we have done and what we're trying to do at the moment to, uh, to cope with uh, move to microservices. So I would say that basically there are two things you need to do, standardization and documentation. Standardization. I put these standard interface adapters. And in general, uh, as we said, your systems will have a lot of inter different interfaces. And if you don't try to find a way to standardize those interfaces across your microservices, you're going to end up with our payload, basically. And you will be the people needing to do all the, the integration between those two things. That's really not what you want. I mean, you kind of want to get the developers as much freedom as possible, why not having to work on a case-by-case -case scenario? You don't want to be involved in deploying every single new microservice, more than you really, really, really need to. You don't want to, to need to rewrite code for a, for a new service or each new class of services or each new language that comes around. So, you need to create adapters. The way to do that is create adapters. And the first and biggest interface, which I didn't name before, because it wasn't really uh, there, is the interface between your application and the US. How do you run the application, right? Uh, how do you develop the application? How do you run it in development? How do you run it in production? Uh, we did uh, a project called Streamline Service Delivery that's still ongoing, uh, whose goal was to basically well, the project started from the release, the release engineering people and the SRE team, so our first goal was to reduce our volume. Uh, the amount of things we have to do day to day to keep the things running, uh, or to ping up a new service and so on. And at the same time, we wanted to reduce the number of things that each developer had to, de to, to deploy them, to develop themselves, or the number of documents they had to read. Uh, 
one of the main points was we want to have consistency between the way uh, the development environment is built, um, the staging and CI environment work, and production works. And at the same time, we wanted uh, flexibility, we wanted dynamic allocation of resources, right? we wanted, uh, finally, and more importantly, to give more control to the developers on their own applications, while giving them less access to production in terms of having root privileges on machines. So I think most of you have understood what the line where we go, where I'm going, yeah, is containers are the classical and more uh, obvious way to uh, wrap an application in an installer. Um, but we decided to use Docker because it's, well, somehow the industry winner, uh, regardless of its technical merits on some things. But Docker files are kind of hard to get right. Probably it's not anymore for you if you've done it uh, consistently, but think of the first time you had to, to think of how caching works in Docker between layers. And now you do cache bust, cache busting when you rebuild an image, right? I don't think somebody that works on the detail, nitty gritty details of how the front end works, like how uh, do you optimize JavaScript working in a browser, needs to know how to build the Docker image, right? How to write the Docker file the right way. So what we try to do is to uh, abstract the logic of building containers from uh, for, for developers if they want to. Right? If they want, they can build their own Docker files. <laughs> but if they don't want to, they just put a dot .pipeline uh, directory in, in their project. They have this declarative file. I hope it reads on the screen. Yes, it reads. Uh, so basically, just going through it very, very fast. Uh, first, they have a they declare what's the base image they want to use for running things in production, which is a Go application, right? Then they have how, how to build the application, how to build the executable, and how to run it in testing, uh, staging, and production. I won't get into the details, there's no point in doing that. It's just the general uh, idea of providing a declarative way for the developers to do things. There's another advantage doing the, the things in this declarative way. So they create this, and then they have the software that we created that builds the images for them locally and deploys them. Um, well, at the end, it will uh, also deploy them to Minikube locally. For now, we're not, yet, we're not still there. Uh, but runs it locally to them, and then that, uh, does all the building also in production and CI. The, the advantage we have is that we have a policy file that basically tells uh, the application that in terms of these things, what things are acceptable in the declaration. So if people, if somebody tried to use uh, the Golang image from Docker Hub there, our CI will tell them no. I mean, it will work in your development, but then you get to CI and CI will tell you, you have to use an image that comes from our registry. You can't use the, an image that comes from Docker Hub. By the way, our registry is public. Please don't download too much, or I will get pinged. Mm. And of course, in production, the solution is to, to the problems I presented to you. I mean, if somebody uses Kubernetes, they would, would have seen from my previous slide that's exactly what kind of solves your problem <sighs> and creates more. Uh, so, this is a general schema of how the thing works. You can see up there, Blubber is the tool that I was talking about that builds the, the containers for you. Uh, it's very standard, the the pipeline. If you were, if you go at KubeCon once, you would see like a hundred of the slides. I was pretty underwhelmed by the fact that last year we, we presented this slide at KubeCon and I've seen like 10, ten other people present the same slide basically. Uh, which means that sometimes in the future some tool that works pretty well doing these things will come out. Uh, I've seen a lot of people taking pictures. All of this is public on our wikis. So yeah, all of our code is public, everything is public, so you can really go and, and look it up. Um, I, I won't spend much time here, I'm, as I just talk about this. Uh, let's go on with interfaces. I talked about the other thing is monitoring, right? I was extremely frustrated across the years that every time a new service came online, I'm answering, right? So I need to know if the service is working correctly or not. So you have to go to talk with the developers and tell them, how do I monitor your, your, your system? How do I verify it works correctly when I, inst when, when I first instantiate a new, a new service, server where it runs, new instance of that? Uh, how do we create alerts on your service? And then decide, we decided to flip the script at some point. So our idea was, okay, you know what? You tell our systems how to do all those things automatically in a declarative way again. 
So our microservices are standardized and using Swagger as uh, for exposing their API contract, and we decided, yeah, okay, let's put uh, an extension inside uh, Swagger. It's permitted by the spec, which is called like samples, very originally. And the idea is that there, the developers will declare um, one specific request out to the param parameters for a specific request and what the response should look like in all the ways possible. So what's going to be in the headers, you see but lots of rejects is here and how the body will be constructed for a response. Uh, then there is a um, service checker software we wrote that will just, you just have to tell it, go to this URL, which is usually the root of the service, and it will download the Swagger spec, look at it, find the examples, um, construct the requests based on what the developers told you, and make the request and check the response. This is great also because it means that when a new, a new version of the application comes out that maybe breaks compatibility with the old version so that an API endpoint has been as that is dead and you were monitoring that, you won't end up getting paged just because they deployed the new version. The monitoring is going to be defined inside the application. So the application will tell your, your monitoring system what needs to be uh, verified and what should alert. So I think this functional testing is great. This is functional testing, basically, right? There is one caveat. Be careful with using that for paging alerts. And the explanation is here in this piece I chose. It's, it's not by chance I chose this piece of example. This is our mobile content service. It's a service that creates a response for your mobile application. If you have the Android or iOS uh, Wikimedia applications, they talk to this service. Uh, this specific endpoint is to get the summary of the page. And we test the San Francisco page very originally since our uh, headquarters are in San Francisco on English Wikipedia. So what happened? One day, the Golden State Warriors, the NBA team from the Bay Area, won the championship again. And somebody was very pissed about that. And you remember, right, that Wikipedia can be edited by anyone. So this guy decided, OK, let's go and mock the Golden State Warriors. And so he went to the page of San Francisco and wiped out the summary and wrote an insult to Golden State Warriors instead. Result, I got the page. Because of course, this service was saying 404, because that page, the summary wasn't fine anymore, right? So I got page, and of course, the, I should get page for this. Is that there are tools for dealing with, anti, with vandals, and there are people that do that work, right, as volunteers, and thank you very much for that. But it's not really what, what I should have the other done. So be careful on the balance and doing functional testing. Finally, uh, logging. I said logging is an American phrase. So one thing that you can't escape is you have to tell people to, to use a standard log format for logging, like use the same fields consistently across applications, or you get really crazy trying to, to index them. You want basically to have the same kind of fields in all the applications, and then sync everything. You tell the developers, you know, don't worry, just sync everything to a local file, or possibly to a local daemon directly in the UDP. But you don't have to worry about uh, reliable transport, we don't have to worry about privacy concerns because everything gets taken care of by our pipeline. I won't say much on the pipeline, that's basically, we, we, we seem to block the daemon uh, via UDP so that the application doesn't get blocked uh, when logging. A lesson we learned the other way. And then the log daemon will enqueue things on Kafka that can work and create between data centers, which is another thing that we need because we have data centers across the globe. And we don't want your the access log with your IP and what you saw or what you edited to be seen, seen across the internet, right? So we have that, that increase all the traffic, that's to, to, to our good here, log stash installation that I want to show here. Uh, but that's not enough. This is, this is great to standardize the way people can send logs to the central place, but there is still a problem. So let's say that page uh, that you create, that, that gets sent to a user is built from 25 microservices. And the user gets an error. How do you track that thing across the 25 microservices? You get crazy. The only way to do that is to standardize on introducing uh, an, an request ID that you pass across all the applications that generated the first application that doesn't find this ID in the address of request. Generates this, this, uh, this ID that gets passed through all the applications. And all the error messages shown to the user will, will use that unified ID, and that unified ID will go in the logs. So, Whenever you, you see an error in your system, like you have an increase of errors and you see, you, you can see the request IDs for, at the edge. Or some user reports to you, I, I found an error on the page. 
And you ask them, can you pass me the strange thing that you got in the error page? And they get that to you and you paste it into your in log stash and you find all the, the stack of logs for that specific request. That's the only way to manage it. If you don't do something like this, it's going to get crazy, trust me. We didn't do that at first and we have to, uh, to run back to, to do that. Finally, there's another thing. Um, let's say your monitoring tells you that your uh, mobile content first time to first paint raised by 20%. Suddenly. But your mobile content calls 50 microservices. How do you find where the performance culprit is? You need tracing. You need to trace the call, the call stack and the times of every call across microservices. We still don't have tracing, but I think it's fundamental and we're going to implement it soon. Great work. Uh, finally, another big problem is the RPC interface. Services will call each other. And as you if you're running microservices that call each other in production, no, as you probably know, it's they're great at DDoSing each other. So you need a way to mediate the calls between the services and to do a lot of the, the work we were talking about, right? Uh, you don't want developers to have to, de to develop from scratch a lot of these things that you need in every new service they build, or it will be take them a lot of time to do that, I and mean, the overhead will, will be worth the uh, costs, right? So what we are doing, it, it's a project that's ongoing, so that's why I put work in progress there, to be honest, it, also because you can check what I said just after the, the, the keynote, looking at our production <laughs> uh, repositories. We're, we're trying to put uh, Envoy, a uh, product created by Lyft that's now it's, uh, in the CNCF, um, as a proxy middleware between services, so in each pod in Kubernetes, uh, we will have the application will only talk locally with Envoy, no TLS, nothing else. But we just know service A is at localhost this part, and that Envoy will take care of calling the right place. Uh, we'll use TLS. We'll do the TLS tunneling for the applications, so that we you don't have to, to check the TLS stack in 55 different languages and find out they're all broken in a different way. Uh, it will protect you, it, it has systems for secret breaking and global rate linking. Uh, so you can protect the service from each other the, uh, from Tangle and Gerd, and also it can you, you have standardized responses to uh, the other service can be telling it I'm more overwhelmed. Also, what we want to do, we're still in the process of doing that. We're, uh, we have our own discovery service that we created a few years ago. Uh, that's another thing you probably need if you have microservices, right? And Envoy integrate, can integrate nicely with it using the data plane instruction. Uh, finally, it provides you some nifty things which are telemetry in the calls between services and to, the, to your, your backend, local backend, and tracing. It can provide tracing for primitives that you can send to, to Zipkin or Jaeger. As you can see here but from the, the diagram, uh, our basically our pods and a few sidecars. One is that, that thing with that this in the symbol is just most of our application and then voice speaks to, to SASD naturally. So we created an adapter that allowed us to uh, expose metrics for Prometheus. And if tomorrow we decide to change from Prometheus to something else, we just have to change this interface. But the, I think we don't need to go to 50 teams, 15 teams in our case, <laughs> to tell them you have to change the way you expose metrics to the public. It's going to all be abstracted in a, in a layer that you put around the application. Um, finally, um, I know that there are people here working on Istio, which is a, a great project, but we try to keep things simple. So we don't want to real the real uh, service mesh, which is like the extreme version of what we're trying to do of abstracting RPC between services. Uh, now let's move to the problem of bandwidth between, uh, as I told you, uh, do microservices means that your infrastructure people and your product people, like people building products, I'm still talking about that case, will have to talk more. Which is a good thing somehow, and, and as long as it doesn't overwhelm either, and typically the, the, the infrastructure people are the ones overwhelmed. So I have to say, standardizing interfaces has been relatively effective in this term, because uh, the developers have a lot less choices that they need to make every day. Uh, but 
At the same time, we need to work a lot on building better documentation. Uh, I know that for um, many SREs or DevOps, documentation is boring, but trust me, it's the only way you can survive uh, such a complex environment. You, you need to, 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 to let people say, okay, before you, you, you start doing something new, you go to, the, to our developer portal, you look at what are the standards, uh, how it works, you can read succinctly how things work without getting into too much detail, but you know how you need to, to what you need to do to implement things. Uh, you have implementation guidelines, and we have a process, a very well defined process, of the, the rules of engagement with us when somebody wants to build a new service. So you need to come to us early so that we can take a look at how the service works in terms of architecture. If we see, since we have, anyways, a holistic view of what architecture, because we are forced to, we can tell you, yeah, you know, this, this stair, think of a building before, just doesn't fit with the rest of the building. You, may, you might need to, to, to add uh, one step to the first step, and so on. So, uh, as I said, if somebody has a solution for the distributed architecture salad problem, please tell me, so I won't show the mitigation for that. There's no mitigation, in my opinion, for that. Uh, let's get to the, to the last point, which is, are microservices worth it? And I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to pro propose you two questions that you have to really answer. Why do you want to use microservices, first of all? You have to answer this question. What are the reasons why you want to move to microservices? And once you've answered that question, and you, you decided if it's a good or bad reasons, good or bad reasons, so you decided it's a good reason, so you want to do that. Then you have to answer the question, is that worth the investment? So let's start with the good and bad reasons. I, when I heard this, I decided I would go with the, with the bad reasons first. But now I'm in a good mood. So let's start with the good reasons. Um, so first of all, um, the typical case in which you want to move to microservices is if you, if you wrote your application in a, in a language that's not particularly performance, uh, performant, uh, but it's very easy to deploy and to, to, to build things up on top of it. So let's say PHP, for example, in our case, or Node.js, or so on. Okay, let's take the case of NPM. I read last week. NPM has its own infrastructure. They had a problem where their Node.js application couldn't scale. Fine. Uh, their authorization uh, system, because of course, you know, Node.js is great at doing unblocking IO, not great at doing hard computation in terms of calculating hashes. So what they had to do to, to scale up, they needed to, to abstract that part from their uh, application and create a new, a new service in Rust. When you have to do this kind of thing, so your application is lagging behind and you have to do more and more optimizations to make it work, it's probably a good idea uh, to start thinking about, okay, we might need to break down the monolith in smaller parts and have these performance sensitive parts to be uh, in some place. Then another possibility is your Google or Facebook or one of the big players you have hundreds of engineering teams and several hundreds of services potentially. In that situation, the advantage that microservices give you in terms of independence of development become fundamental. And I agree. If you're that big, I mean, really, right, you have hundreds of development teams. There is no way you can survive without microservices. So you should go that way, even if it costs, no matter what the, co what the cost is. If you're not that big, and I, I'm willing to bet that mm, not many people here work in such a big organization. Well, well you, you have to think about it. Uh, another good reason, like the performance one, is you have security needs, right? Uh, let's make an example. A lot of you probably work in e-commerce, right? You don't want the part of your application that show uh, banners to people to be the same application that at the same time does payments or work with credit cards. You want to separate concerns. So in that case, starting to build microservices might make sense. Finally, uh, and I think this is the best reason to do that, you're secretly working for a large cloud provider and you get a share of the bill. In that case, I agree, it's a really good idea to move to, uh, to microservices. Well, now to the bad reasons, and I think they're pretty common, honestly, and I'm just talking about things that I've seen personally in my career around me. So the first one is, it's 15 years you're building technical debt. And 
the fact that I said 15 years is absolutely by chance, uh, nothing to do with place and work. Uh, and you have people saying, our developers can't work with that monolith, the code is so legacy, we can't. So we need to go to microservices. What you're doing when you say that is that you're, the, you're uh, moving the technical debt from the monolith to the infrastructure. And then it's, you know, ops problem now, right? That's a really bad reason to do it. Another very bad reason is, oh, one day we'll be uh, as big as Google. So we need to work as Google does. We need Kubernetes. We need microservices. Uh, we need no SQL. Yeah, no. It's that simple, really. If, you, if you're small, just, just work for small, and then you can move up whenever you need it. And the next one is, one of the worst reasons, and I have to say, I'm guilty as charged. That's something that happens to me as well, and I have to control myself all the time. We are technologists, right? We do love what we do. Um, we really enjoy looking at new technologies. When we see something exciting, let's say Kubernetes was basically, for me, it was like a, a revelation, right? Uh, for a long time, I thought, I need something to do things that way. And then Google said, okay, you know, we've been doing things that way you know, at home for a long time. Now, take, we have a, a reduced version, a poor man's version of that for you. I was like, wow, finally, I want to play with that. And I had to work with myself to tell myself, okay, let's start to be sure that I'm not rationalizing that I need Kubernetes because I, I would like to play with it. That, uh, that's the same for developers and SREs. We all love to, to work with new good things, and so working with microservices is very, 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 very nice. Allows you to work with all these new good toys. So we tend to uh, ju create justifications to ourselves. You shouldn't do that because it's your life and your pager that's going to pay. Then there's the other reason, which is, oh, the cool kids do it, right? Netflix and Spotify are all microservices, so. Wow, who gets to do it, so it must be cool and we should do it as well. Yes, it's probably cool, but since you're probably not Spotify or Netflix, well, think about it before you go to do whatever they're doing. I mean, if I try to, I, I think it's uh, Air Jordans are very, very nice, but uh, I'm a 40 year old techie, uh, overweight. If I put on Jordans, uh, I just look stupid. Then another thing I hear all the time is people that misquote Conway's law. So people say, oh, we have a lot of teams. So Conway's law says that we need to buy microservices. No, Conway's law that tells you that either you adapt your organization to the structure of your project, of, of your software, or you adapt the software to the structure of your organization. Guess which one of, of the things is less expensive? Also, always low can be perfectly fit with a modular architecture inside a single monolith. There's no way there's a difference between that and building microservices at that small scale at least. Finally, and I heard this quite a lot in the last few years, I thought lately there is a wave of sanity about this. A microservice architecture is theoretically superior, which is exactly what people told Linux Torvalds when it was developing Linux at first. But then in the end, Linux worked, and you know, it didn't care about scalability at first. It didn't look at how cool people were doing it. But it worked be better, and I'm switching back to the, to, the, to the first slide, like the comment from Sergey Lopez about the uh, microcode. You know. Okay, once you've, you, you've understood what's the reasons why you want to do microservices, and you said, okay, this is a good reason, then you have to reason about how much investment that is. So, but my point, the point of world talk is either you build your own infrastructure yourself or you pay somebody else for, uh, for building it, right? And then you end up with vendor looking. Be it cloud, be it some solution like OpenShift, you have to be conscious that you pay somebody else for the implementation and then you're locked with them. Probably for the foreseeable future. Even if Kubernetes promises to abstract things a little bit, bit I don't buy it that much. The point is that to obtain the same level of operational excellence that you can obtain when you have a single, simple, simpler infrastructure, when you have microservices, you will have, we will have to invest a lot on that, that infrastructure, on people building that infrastructure. Your infrastructure will be more complex 
and really less boring. And I'm, I'm using the boring term because it comes from a blog post from some year, years ago that you should all read, which is in the title Choose Boring Technology. The point was less production, you want it to be boring. Boring meaning it doesn't pay you at 3 a.m. at night. Trust me, if you're not doing that and you think about moving to Kubernetes, that's not boring. Uh, and the first way in which it's not boring is that it has a nine months life cycle. So if you, if, you, if you upgraded last time Kubernetes more than nine months ago, your version is now unsupported. Uh, I would ask, how many people here use Kubernetes in production? Oh, not much, okay. So how many have an updated version, a supported version? Okay, less than half. It worked. Uh, by the way, I should have raised my hand. And our version is now supported since a few days, but we're, we're going to fix that. Uh, <laughs> the point is, you need to hire people. You have to tell your CTO, you want to do microservices, hire an infrastructure server team of skilled and experienced people to manage it. As you're just going to create for yourself a real problem and you're basically arming yourself. So the idea of a world, serve, a world talk is understanding if you need microservices, create what the cool people call a cloud-native environment. Sorry, every time I have to say cloud-native, I die inside a little bit. Uh, try to create a, an abstraction for developers so that they just can concentrate on the core of what they need to develop and they don't have to make choices that can harm you. Um, invest a lot in your infrastructure, really invest in your infrastructure if you want to go the long this way and prepare for being absolutely not bored. Okay, I stayed short a few minutes, that's great. So uh, I have time. Thank you for first of all for <laughs> doing my audience.